My first Sunday in ministry here was in August of 2003. And on that Sunday morning, <coughs> um, I arrived a bit early, which is my custom, um, and practiced my sermon a few times, made sure everything was in order, and then as folks arrived, uh, I shook a few hands and I went downstairs to robe and to say some prayers. Prayers like, God, I don't know who thought this was a good idea. <laughs> but I can't turn back now, so some assistance would be appreciated. So I, I went downstairs, and there was a commotion by the kitchen. And I walked over there, and Sally Martin and Zella Olson and Reva Johnson were standing outside of the kitchen, and the, the shutters were drawn, and the door was shut, and they were somewhat agitated. And I said, what's going on? And Zella said, there's a bat in the kitchen. <laughs> And I said, oh, a bat, huh. But inside I was thinking, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? No one told me there were bats in this church. It's, that should be like a, bold, a line in bold on the church profile, just like the background check that clergy have to go through. Does your church have bats, yes or no? It should be clear. So anyway, I'm standing there panicking, and Zella says, I guess I'll take care of it. And she grabs a broom and she walks into the kitchen. She opens the door to the kitchen. She spe peeks in and then goes, oh, and shuts the door. <laughs> At this point, Sally Martin taps me on the shoulder. Stand back, honey. I'll take care of this. <laughs> she grabs the broom. She goes into the kitchen. She opens the door, slams it behind her. And we, and we wait in their silence. Silence, and then, hoo, 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 oh, oh, and she opens the door, slams it, and she, says, she hands me the broom, and she says, oh, honey, that was too much for me. <laughs> so here I am. It's three minutes before worship is scheduled to start, and I'm walking into the kitchen with a broom in my hand, and there's a bat circling around. Not where I expected to be as church was getting ready to start. So I didn't, I didn't want to hurt this bat, so I take one tip mid-swing at the bat, and the bat whoop, goes around the broom, circles around again. It comes back. I take another timid swing at the bat. It whoop, circles around again. I was like, okay, I've got stuff to do this morning. <laughs> so it comes around again, and oh, I, swung as, I swung hard. I hit the bat right on the nose. It hit the ground. It slid across the floor into the oven, and I just stared at it. I was like, what a violent act just before <laughs> church. What does this mean for the start of my ministry? So I came upstairs and started worship traumatized by this whole experience. Bats have added excitement to my life in this church. I found bats in a variety of places, in, the, in potted plants in my office, in the wastebasket. Bats have flown out of the organ pipes like during worship, like in some sort of Scooby-Doo cartoon. <laughs> Sarah has called me at night. I'm in the church by myself, screaming, and there's a bat in here. What do I do? And I said, call Mike Damp. He'll come down. He'll take care of it right away. It'll be no problem. Anyway, six months ago, I'm, I'm talking with this couple who's getting ready to get married, a couple from the Mineral Point Church, and the, the, hus the husband-to-be is a certified bat handler. Do. Yeah, yeah. And so he taught me the appropriate way to handle bats. Apparently you take, you have gloves on your hands, you get them when they're resting, and you just grab them in your hands so they can't fly, and then you, you take them outside. The nets will get their wings caught. I was like, oh, well, that's, that's interesting information. I hope I never have to put it into use. <laughs> then one day, a few months ago, I'm sitting in my office. The door's open just a crack. It's, it's in the afternoon. And I, I see something fall from the top of the window in my office to the bottom, and I hear this thump against my window. I say, hello? <laughs> I go over to the door. I shut it. I look out of my office in the hallway. Don't see anything. After a while, I think, okay, I've got to come out of the office sometime. <laughs> and then I step out, and I see a bat it's flying around. I shut the door again, wait for a few more minutes. Again, i got to come out of the office. And I look and around the corner, and there's the bat just resting on the ground. So I grabbed my winter gloves, and I went and I picked up the bat with my own hands. And it looked at me and started squeak, 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 squeak. 
and it also did this. <laughs> and I carried it outside and put it in the shrub, and then it, it flew off. And I thought, oh, I've come a long way. <laughs> so I hope that at the new church there are no bats. No, no bats. When I left seminary, I didn't know what I thought of the idea of call. Through the ordination process, you tell your call story and about the moments you feel God, God has been calling you into pastoral ministry. And this is, these are based on the call stories in the scriptures of the prophets, of Jesus, of Paul on his way to Damascus. I was fine talking about the moments where I felt like God was calling me into pastoral ministry. But as we entered into the search and call process, we were looking for a job. We were supposed to be discerning God's call to a particular congregation over another one. And I didn't know what to think about that. I didn't know if the Holy Spirit micromanaged in this way. And I grew up in a small church and knew some pastors that I, I really did not think were called to our congregation. But over the years, I've come to believe that I was truly called to be here in ministry with you. I interviewed with two other congregations after I interviewed here in Dodgeville for this position. And the reason I accepted this call was twofold. One was Ginger Jones was very persistent <laughs> in uh, staying in touch with us. And the other was that we simply had a good feeling as we left Dodgeville and started driving back home. We couldn't explain it any more than that. We just had a good feeling. We didn't know anything about the area. We didn't, we didn't know about what a unique rural area this is, not just in Wisconsin, but generally speaking. We, we knew nothing. We just had a good feeling. And it turns out that this has been a very good place for us as a family. It's been a great place for me as I've been beginning my ministry. This has been a good place, a good fit for my gifts. I've discovered that my gifts were a good fit for the people who were here in the church and in the community and for the work that was already going on in the community and work that was about to begin in the community. And there was no way to know that, but it seems that the Spirit had a hand in all of this. And so as you move towards searching for a new called pastor in the next few months, I think it's important to say that I believe that the Holy Spirit truly has a hand in this work of transition and finding someone new. It's mystery, it's not rational, but I believe it's true because it's proved true in my life. It's proved true in our time together. So I encourage you to pray for your future, that you may determine if you and Mineral Point are called to go forward together as yoke congregations, and if so or if not, that you may find the person you are looking for and the person who is looking for you. It's been fun to think about all that's happened since 2003. I had countless conversations and theological debates at the men's breakfast group on Thursday mornings at the truck stop. The grassroots citizens in Wisconsin had their first exploratory meetings in our basement shortly after I arrived. And that relationship led to the formation of the Discovery Series, a series of spiritual enrichment forums. The Community Connections Free Clinic started, and a few folks around here got involved in that. We helped start a homeless shelter and a homelessness coalition and are now involved in a pilot project, a pilot scattered transitional housing project in Dodgeville. We went on a mission trip to Past Christiane, Mississippi after Hurricane Katrina, and then to or New Orleans every year that we could. And this last year, the disaster squad went to Joplin. We helped start an English as a second language tutoring program that now boasts around 25 tutors and serves a local Hispanic community. We sent countless trunk loads of food to the food pantry, provided many tanks of gas, bags of groceries, and assistance for bills and rent to people who were just trying to get by over the years. I think we've become known as the go-to mission church in the community in many ways. That's an identity I would encourage you to claim and to build on going forward. There are many pastors who are excited to work with any congregation who has a strong history of outreach and wants someone to help them strengthen it going forward. Confirmation classes and adults have taken trip to the Buddhist temple in Oregon, Temple Bethel Synagogue in Madison, the Islamic Center of Madison, as well as to Chicago to visit an evangelical megachurch, Willow Creek Community Church and Trinity UCC, the largest United Church of Christ uh, church that there is currently, predominantly African American church on the south side of Chicago. Sunday school changed to a multi-age format 
It was always changing around a bit. We started celebrating communion every Sunday. We received a new baptismal font, new pyramids, banners behind the cross, a video camera that puts us on local access television for everyone to see. We blessed a new peace garden. You watched my hair grow, and then you watched it being shorn. <laughs> you celebrated the building's 100th anniversary and then replaced and paid for a new roof. You've made about 72,000 pasties in the time that I've been here. <laughs> we had Lenten events at the church, in homes, campouts. I have an unblemished record with outdoor services. Not one has been rained out, so the next outdoor service you have, you might want to bring an umbrella. We had countless Bible studies, watched the Ten Commandments with Charlton Heston. We've seen children grow and graduate. We celebrated the birth of babies and celebrated the life of dear friends. You've sat through over 400 of my sermons. That's 100 hours of sermons, four full 24-hour days of sermons. <laughs> Fortunately, you didn't have to hear them all at one time. <clears throat> And you entered into the yoke relationship with the Mineral Point congregation. This was a significant event in our ministry together. And the movement towards that decision and the aftermath wasn't always easy. As we were preparing to enter the yoke relationship, I told colleagues that it was kind of like I was leaving without leaving. There was an awareness that my participation in the life of the church would change. It was going to be different. And that was true. I couldn't be as present, and I intentionally wasn't as present. As I stepped into the yoke position, I wanted to make sure that I didn't bite off more than I could chew. I was used to giving my energy to everything that was happening around here. But I knew that in the yoke relationship, I wouldn't be able to work that way. It wouldn't be good for me or for my family, and it wouldn't be helpful for our two churches or whomever might follow me in this position. I hope the churches have become used to a pastor being where the pastor really needs to be while getting used to the pastor not being everywhere. If I was able to do that, and you remain, you remain in the yoke relationship, then there should be a healthier expectation of what a pastor could do and should do in this position. <clears throat> in our passage from John for today, Jesus greets a group of anxious disciples. They are anxious because Jesus has left. And since he was killed on the cross, they feel they are in grave danger, too. But Jesus appears in their midst and simply says, Peace be with you. Don't be afraid. He says, As God has sent me, so I send you. And he breathes on them, giving them the power of the Holy Spirit. Jesus is telling not only these disciples, but the church, and especially any church in any anxious time, Don't be afraid. The Holy Spirit will be with you. The power of God is here. You are still sent as a congregation. You still have the same mission to join with God in the healing of the world. Don't stay in this room forever. You have to go out and serve. Pastoral transitions are never easy. But when you say, peace be with you and worship over the next few weeks and months, may you hear Christ saying to you, there's no need to be afraid. The Holy Spirit is here, still present and you are still the church, still sent to serve. Thank you for the opportunity to be able to serve with you in ministry here. Thank you for your kindness to me and to my family. I will always be grateful to this congregation for all you have given me. May God bless you in your continued ministry. Amen. <clears throat>